My daughter died six years ago. Today I saw her at a birthday party. In December of 1997, an electrical fire started in my house while myself and my family were sleeping. I grabbed two of my kids and quickly got them out of the house before it burned down, and then I ran back in to save my baby named Delamar. When I got to the crib, she wasn't there, so I figured she had either made her way out or a firefighter had gotten her. But when I came back out, there was no sign of her. I asked firefighters if they got her, and they had not. Shortly after the house completely burned down and firefighters informed me that my daughter had died in the fire. I couldn't believe it and screamed and yelled at them that my daughter wasn't in the house, but they continued to assure me that she had passed. Life went on for six years and I grieved the loss of her every single day. However, one day in 2003, my whole world would change. I was at a birthday party and met a young girl named Aaliyah. She was so kind and sweet, but I couldn't get over the fact of how much she looked like my daughter Delamar. So I went to the store and got a Dan sample test and gave it to Aaliyah. Sure enough, she was my daughter Delamar. You see, six years prior, a woman broke into my house and took my baby. She then started the fire to make it seem like the fire killed my baby. The woman who did it was charged with arson and kidnapping. Follow for more stories. Happy Sunday, guys. Hope you're having a great Sunday. I am. Anyways, let's go ahead and uh, talk about 19-year-old Ashley Cheatham right here. Because, uh, guys, whole toilet brush trash can, allegedly, for educational purposes only. But wait to hear about this. So go ahead and get out your peak buckets, hold on to your butts, and trigger warning on everything. Because Oklahoma, you on the board today. So according to the Stillwater Police, around Tuesday morning at 10, 11 a.m., a distraught man comes bursting in to the police department, losing his good mind, talking about, I need to see a police officer right now. And everybody shut the hell up. I mean, he probably didn't say that, but I would have. Anyways, so he's like, look, I need to talk to a cop. So a cop meets with him. He's like, look. I've been dating this woman. I met her online. We started dating. She became my girlfriend. So I moved her the hell in with me and my three-year-old daughter. And it, they don't specify how long they've been living together, he said. But, you know, she's been acting real strange. So last night I decided when she fell asleep, I was going to stay up and look at whatever in the hell she had on her phone. So the father tells the police, like, when Cheatham fell asleep, I started scrolling through her phone. I didn't know what in the hell she was up to, but I sure as hell didn't think that I would find images and videos of my child being essayed on my 19-year-old girlfriend's cell phone. But that's what this man found. So anyways, it was so disturbing, according to police, they went and arrested Ashley immediately. And allegedly, for educational purposes only, there is video of her getting arrested at their shared apartment, and she is very scantily clad. I didn't share that video, but it is out there. But who would, who in the hell would want to see somebody who's into essay and three-year-olds naked? You know what I'm saying? I sure the hell would. And the only thing I want to see her in is a jumpsuit in jail. And then once she's in jail, I need her to go on and go, you know where to hell. So the police haven't released what kind of files were on Ashley's phone exactly or how many files were there. They just kind of wanted to give a public service announcement saying, watch who in the hell you bring your children around, except they said it more professionally and not as aggressively. They said you may want to do like a thorough background check before you bring your your children around somebody. You know, you may want to know somebody longer than two weeks off of social media before you ask them to be your boyfriend and girlfriend and then you move them the hell in with your children. But what do I know? I don't even have any children. But anyways, uh, I mean, who in the hell can you trust anyways? I'm the most trustworthy person I know, and I don't even trust myself. So you know how perpetitos, they try to wiggle their way into uh, professions, positions, and volunteer work that give them access to more victims? Well, speaking of that, Ashley was in the process of getting hired to be a paraprofessional at a local elementary school, and her arrest probably prevented the victimization of dozens of other young children. So Ashley, who is allegedly, for educational purposes only, admitted to her crime, is currently in the Payne County Jail of Erin, Oklahoma, and she ain't getting out anytime soon. Hopefully, she's going to stay in jail, and then she's going to hell, allegedly, for educational purposes only. But let's look at her charges. So Ashley is charged with S.A. of a child under 12 because the child was 3 make or distribute types of obscene material or CSAM or what is legally known still as CP, possession of paraphernalia in violation of the Oklahoma Computer Crimes Act. And I couldn't find a bond for Ashley because I hope she ain't got one. Anyways, guys, just remember, just watch who in the hell you bring your kids around. 
You don't need to know somebody for a week and then move them to hell into your house. Get to know somebody first and then let them disappoint you. Well, anyways, guys, I hope you're having a great Sunday and I'll talk to you later. Bye. This car sat here for a week and people had no idea the horror that laid inside. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Hannah Hill. Viewer discretion is advised. Hannah Hill was born in Akron, Ohio. She had no siblings. She grew up doing really, really well in school. Shortly before the story took place, she graduated from high school. She had her college picked out and was ready to go. But sadly, that would not get to happen. It was May 19th, 1999. Hannah was living at home with her parents. She had been living with her boyfriend, but they had a very back and forth and tumultuous relationship. Hence why she moved out of the place with him and back with her parents, but they were still dating. Hannah got home that May 18th evening around 9 p.m. Then she would leave the house again around 10.30 p.m. She told her parents that she would be home just a little bit later, but that never happened. So the following afternoon, after she still hadn't gotten home, the parents reported her missing. But of course, like always, the police said, meh, she's 19. This is what they do. And they didn't take it seriously. Nor did police actually physically file the report. Hannah's car was found the next day. She was nowhere near it, and none of her belongings were inside. She got, like, a traffic ticket and a parking ticket put on it. Police were aware that this was her car. They still did nothing. But then after a week passed, they were like, okay, let's go to the car. They opened the trunk. Inside of it, 19-year-old Hannah Hill. She had been murdered. She was nude from the waist down. She was beaten, and she was strangled to death. The first person they go to is her on-again, off-again boyfriend. His name was Brad O'Born. When they interviewed him, he had scratches and bruises on him. He even said that he and Hannah had gone into an argument, uh, I think the night of, the night before she disappeared. But they weren't able to actually connect him to her murder. When they went through phone records, they came across one person's name, Denny Ross. He was a friend of Hannah's. She had gone to parties with him. There was indications that they found that the two of them met that night, and he confirmed it. He said that she came to his apartment and she was very distraught, and she was sober. But police know that's not true because Hannah's blood alcohol level indicated she was drunk. He said that before she left, they kissed, but then she left his apartment around 1.30 a.m. Police searched his apartment, and outside of his apartment, they found a black trash bag, and inside it were Hannah's belongings, including her purse and her clothing items. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. But at his trial, there was an issue with one of the jurors. They told the jury information that was not presented at the trial. So because of that one juror, they declared a mistrial. Then they tried to say that double jeopardy would apply and he couldn't be tried again. So for the next couple of years, this went back and forth with like state courts and federal courts. And finally they said, no, this does not work with double jeopardy. He can be tried. By the time his retrial would happen, he was already in prison for 25 years because he had sexually assaulted another woman and attempted to kill her. He did that in October of 2004. That victim said he assaulted her at knife point and basically performed the sexual assault on her. At one point, she actually pretended to black out as if she was dead, where she heard him say, oh, fuck. She's dead. Not again. He had actually beaten her and strangled her, which is why she pretended to fake like she was dead. But that's the exact same thing that happened to Hannah. Beaten, strangled, sexually assaulted. So now he goes on trial for the murder of Hannah Hill. Finally, in 2012, 13 years after the murder of Hannah Hill, he went on trial, was found guilty, and sentenced to 19 years to life. On top of the 25-year sentence, he was already serving. There is a very strong chance that he will never get out of prison. And one can only hope. As you probably heard by now, Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt have been arrested on two counts each of, of aggravated child abuse. A few people commented on my last video saying that they didn't know who Ruby Frankie is. And so I'll just do a little recap of who she is. But you can also check out my playlist of family vloggers. There's tons of videos on there about it. Ruby, Frankie, and her husband, Kevin, had a really popular YouTube channel called Eight Passengers. They have six kids together. They're Mormon. They are family vloggers. And they had 2.3 or so million 
followers. On their vlogging channel, they made a lot of questionable parenting decisions that, you know, became very controversial. All the while exploiting their children and making money profiting off of all of these videos. So for example, one time the teacher called Ruby to say that her kindergarten kid didn't bring her lunch and Ruby refused to bring the lunch to the school. She wanted to teach the six-year-old a lesson. She often used food as punishment and said like dinner was a privilege and things like that. She sent her teenage son, Chad, to a troubled teen industry like camp for months. Then shortly after he returned, she took away his bedroom for seven months, making him sleep on the floor and on a beanbag chair. She took away the kid's privacy as punishment, like removing bathroom doors and things. She took away her two youngest kids' um, Christmas as punishment. She just made a lot of parenting decisions where people were like, you're being too harsh and it was you just inappropriate. Ruby then joined Jody Hildebrandt um, doing this Moms of Truth Facebook page and joining this thing called Connections where they're like sp supposedly being parenting gurus, giving life advice that was also very controversial. The two of them would give really damaging parenting advice and, you know, being really just, they called everybody distorted. They said anything that they didn't agree with was was wrong and distorted. It was really kind of cultish. And it's just really insane that now Ruby had turned into like this parenting guru after everybody saw online how she was not a good parent. Her oldest daughter, Sherry, who's 20, I believe, went off to college and then realized that, you know, it was all craziness that she grew up in and cut off contact with her mother. And last night, Ruby and Jody were both arrested. Apparently, Sherry said that family has been trying for years to get CPS and police involved because there's abuse going on at home. According to Reddit, 20 plus officers responded last night to the scene with representatives from federal, state and local levels. We don't know the specifics of what led to the arrest, but I'm sure that information will all come out soon. That's just a really short synopsis, but let me know your thoughts in the comments. We knew that something bad had to have happened for, to warrant, you know, Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt to be both arrested and I read that Ruby is being held without bail. So something bad must have really happened. And Fox 13 has been reporting new details on what went down. Apparently, police say that the children were found with severe malnourishment, neglect, and abuse at Jody's house. So apparently what happened was one of the children climbed out of a window at around 10.50 a.m. Wednesday and ran to a neighbor's home for help. Now, why were they at Jody's house? I don't know. Some people have rumored that maybe... Ruby and Jody are a little closer than just business partners. Whatever. Either way, the children were in H Jody Hildebrand's home. The child knocked on the door and asked for food and water, but the neighbor noticed duct tape on the child's ankles and wrists and called the police. The juvenile appeared to be emaciated and malnourished with open wounds and duct tape around the extremities, which is why they're saying it was like severe, which is why it's aggravated child abuse. After the first child was taken to hospital, another child was discovered in the home and was found to be malnourished as well. Now, I believe that these are the two youngest children, but I haven't seen any confirmation. A search warrant was obtained by police, and during the search of the home, evidence was located consistent with markings found on the juvenile. Ruby was on a YouTube video being filmed at Jody's house just days before, so police therefore concluded that Ruby must have known about this abuse and therefore was charged as well. So the four younger children are in the care of DCSF right now. Hopefully they'll be able to go to family members. Also, apparently Ruby refused to speak with police and instead just lawyered up and she's being held without bail.
Christina was in the car? Uh, by our calculations from when she was placed in the vehicle and then removed uh, five hours and 43 minutes and some seconds thereabout. You're familiar with this car? It's in the impound lot, I'm assuming, at the sheriff's office? I am, sir. You've been in the car? Yes, sir. Air conditioning work? The air conditioning does work. Even today? Even, even as of this morning, it still works. You go to, I think this is 1646. Again, military time, that is... It's 4, 4, that's 4 p.m., 4.46 p.m. What's going on in this scene right here? So they have, uh, they have gone to town and retrieved a second key fob to come back and unlock the vehicle. And um, we know that from, from their statement and from the fact well, that he's so holding... This specifically. In this picture right here, what, what, what can you tell me is going on? He is pushing the key fob and the park lights are flashing, minute, indicating... You can see the lights flashing there. Okay. So obviously, the key fob is working. The vehicle is receiving a signal from the key fob. And I am not an expert, but I can tell you that I can replicate a standard. And when we put that vehicle inside the processing bay and we attempted to replicate that, uh, you cannot get the vehicle to flash the park lights if the vehicle's running. End of story. They, there's no... Uh, we also then contacted Volkswagen. Okay, and let's leave it with that. So okay. You, you yourself check this out. We did over and over and over again. The lights are flashing. The car's not on. If those lights are flashing from that key fob, the vehicle is not running. And I mean, it can't even be just the ACC. In other words, if you get in and start the ACC, the you know the ACC. Right. It can't be activated at all. Did you ever go there and say? Maybe it's possible that he did this? No, because I think that I hold a very unique perspective that nobody else in that courtroom ever held, and I know the love that I have witnessed. Well, if you thought we were done with the Murdoch case, clearly you would be wrong. Buster Murdoch finally broke his silence and gave an interview to Fox News' Martha McCallum. Now, this interview took place a couple of months ago. They have been putting together, I believe, a three-part series that will air starting tomorrow night on the subscribers only channel fox nation it is called the fall of the house of murdoch a couple of excerpts from that interview have been released and the first one is that buster murdoch clearly says that his father is probably a psychopath tell us something we don't know but he does not believe that his father is responsible for maggie and paul's death he maintains that there is someone out there that could be putting him in danger potentially, and that that's what he goes to sleep with every night. The fact that he is, his life is potentially in danger because he doesn't believe his father killed his mother and his brother. Specifically, Buster said, I do not think he could be affiliated with endangering my mother and brother. We have been here for a while now, and that's been my stance. Meaning they had been in that interview for a while now, and he was not gonna change his story no matter how many times she asked him or how many different ways she asked him. When asked about Stephen Smith, Buster was very adamant that he did not have anything to do with the death of Stephen Smith. He stated that not only did he not have anything to do with the death of Stephen Smith, he never had anything to do with Stephen Smith. That there are rumors and that rumors have been very hurtful to him. He states that the rumors that he had anything at all to do with Stephen Smith's death have been very, 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 very terrible. That it has harmed him and his reputation. That he said he has been perceived as a murderer. And he's walking around with that on his shoulders. And I kind of feel bad for the kid because I actually believe him. I don't think he had anything to do with Stephen Smith's murder. When asked where he was that night, he said he was in Edisto at the beach house. And he was asked, was he with his family? And he said he was with his mother and brother. The only two people that cannot be here to corroborate his story. So if you want to watch that, follow the House of Murdoch. And he up for that subscription because you are not going to be able to watch it unless you pay for it. And apparently in that special, they also are going to have interviews with Dick Harputley and Jim Griffin, key witnesses in the case like Mark Keels, and also some behind-the-scenes looks 
I don't know something. They're going to have some behind-the-scenes stuff, is what they said. So, welcome back to the Murdoch saga. Please keep in mind that Stephen Smith's death has been investigated as a homicide since June. There were rumors that the grand jury was impaneled since June, and no charges have been filed against anyone. But grand jury proceedings are secret, so I don't know what's going on behind those closed doors. Ironized Yeast presents Light Out. What? What's wrong with you? <laughs> then what? It took my daughter. Parker? Please. 